How's everybody doing? You good? Good to see you guys here today, man. Thank you for joining us online. Man, it is interesting times, but we are glad to be here. First, I want to say, uh, I don't know if you can tell online, but if you can tell, we have a, we have a pulpit here, and it's been our thing. We bought before we started raising, first thing we did, and um, it was, we found it at an antique place, and we thought it was the 1870s. It was a lamp stand. And I thought, what a perfect uh, pulpit to kind of put the Word of God, which is the Word of the Lamp, into our feet and lines, by the place to put it in priest spun the lampstand. Well, just a couple weeks ago, Amanda's cousin, who refinishes uh, uh, antique equipment, able to take this and cleaned it up, polished it, and made it look nice and sturdy. And it's about, he actually found it was from the 1850s. So super cool. I wanted to give a shout out to him. It was so cool for that. We are in our series on peace. And really speaking to the idea of how that we can experience peace, right? I mean, in our world today, we see a lot of conflict. Conflict in our world, conflict internally, uh, and even some kind of feeling of disconnected with God. And we want to talk about peace. And we want to start with this, or end with the peace with each other. Let me talk about the story. Esther Pauline Friedman and Pauline Esther Friedman, yes, I said that right, were identical twins born 17 minutes apart in 1918 in Sioux City, Iowa. I don't know. It makes me laugh, first of all, the names, Esther Pauline and Pauline Esther. I don't know if the mom and dad were just expecting one child and two came out. and like, we only got one name. Let's just switch it around. I don't know, but that's their names. And so they were, you can imagine, they were close. They were twins. They, they did everything together. They grew up together in a place. It, it, wherever the one went, the other went. When they went to college, they were roommates together. They worked on the school newspaper together. So much so that when they were um, getting married, they actually got married on the same day in a double ceremony. I mean, I'm talking about doing all things together. And so this continued. Epi, Esther her name Epi, kind of a short Epi, she actually filled and went out for a, um, kind of get a, uh, went a, I just lost my train of thought. Contest. contest, thank you. Did a contest to try to see if she could win to be an article writer for the Chicago Times. She won and became an um, advice columnist for the Chicago Times. Well, her sister, a couple of months later, followed suit, and she started her own advice column. And they began to do it, and they got, they were so good. They had such a unique uh, way they approached things. They were very, they were very, had a lot of quips. They were very sharp and smart. And so they became really famous pretty quickly. So much so that they became syndicated. Now, you may not know those names, but some of you may know the names of Dear Abby and Ask Ann Landers. Now, for some of you who are younger, this was back before they had the internet, and they actually had these things called newspapers, and people wrote into the news. Can you imagine waiting? I'm going to write this question to the newspaper. It may take them a month to get back to me. Now we write on a self-help website, hey, ask me this question, and we're upset in like 20 seconds they didn't respond. But back then, they people followed them. Uh, millions and millions of people around the world would follow Dear Abby or Ask Ann Landers. Unfortunately, as their success grew, their relationship deteriorated. In fact, so much that they became rivals of each other. It is said one story that uh, Dear Abby one time came back to their home newspaper and said, look, I will give you a discounted rate if you publish mine, but do not publish my sister's. Can you imagine? Two that were so close began to be so separate. In fact, for five years, they did not talk. Now, after those five years, they did, they did get put together and reconcile, but really, people that were around them, so the rest of their life, they were, their relationship was always at odds. I find it interesting. I find it sad that these individuals who gave so much advice of how others to deal with conflict could not deal with the conflict in their own lives, did not know how to deal with it. And all the success that they had, they were successful people. They missed out on the biggest part of their life, which was the gift of each other. You see, peace really affects the quality of our life. And it's the same to be said that peace with others affects our quality of life. And that's been the heart of it. Because so many of us don't live in peace with ourselves, with God, and with each other. And and we feel like we don't know how to embrace that. That was kind of hard this series to talk about what it means to have peace with God, with others, and with ourselves. We were talking about the last couple of weeks. We see that Jesus promised us peace. John 14, 27 says this. Jesus is talking, peace I leave you. My peace I give you. 
I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. Jesus is speaking in this verse, look, I have given you peace. It's not the world, the peace the world gives you. And we first learned what the difference was, is that the peace that God gives is not a peace we have to chase. It's not a feeling we have to chase but it is a position that we can embrace. Let me say that again. Peace, true peace, the peace that Jesus gives us is not a feeling we have to chase. We chase the feeling of peace so many times in life. Man, this or this situation, I can go out to the woods and nobody's going to be there. I can get away from people. I got to chase after peace. But God says, I've given you peace to embrace the peace that God's given you. We talk about having peace with God. Last week, we talked about how to have peace within And what we also learned in this whole series is that these three things, these three types of peace, peace with God, peace with ourselves, and peace with others are intrinsically linked. They really are. Because here's the fact. I will not have peace with others when I don't have peace within. Have you ever heard it saying, hurt people hurt people? When I'm not at peace inside, I can guarantee you there's going to be no peace around me. I can't have peace with others until I have peace within. And I can't truly, and I really believe this, I can't truly have peace within for an extended period of time. We can have moments unless I really understand and embrace my peace with God. And so if you missed on the first message of how to have peace with God, I would strongly encourage you to watch it, to go back and listen to it, and understand that Jesus through his death and resurrection, offers us peace with God. It's nothing that we have to do. We just have to accept it. And when we have peace with God, we begin to hear what he says about ourselves, who our value is, who he says we are. He also speaks to our worth and to our, how much he loves us and to our value. And it's not determined what other people have said or not said in our life, right? Sometimes we take our value and worth not because what people said mean against us, but the absence of what they did not say, right? We take a hurt because someone didn't speak into our life. And so we must find peace within, not based on other people or circumstances, but connecting with the God who says, I am willing to die for you. You are worth, you matter, you have, you have meaning because I love you. I have peace with God, I can have peace within. And when I can embrace and really be settled that I don't have to be angry with myself, I don't have to feel this shame and guilt, I can let things go, I can be at peace within. And when I'm at peace within, I can begin to embrace the position of being at peace with others. This is our thought for the day. This is going to end our series, How Do We Have Peace With Others? Because I guarantee if we were kind of do a survey around this room, the majority of the times that peace has been robbed in your life, the majority of the times that you've been pushed out of peace, it probably had to do with someone else. Would you all agree? They may be here now. They may be at the couch right beside you. They may not be anymore in your life. But they, there was someone in your life that had a place that pushed you out of position of peace. God really values peace with others. And so much so that when Jesus, in his first big message, like Jesus kind of coming out and talking about who he is, what his kingdom's going to be about, what his followers look like. This is his first message, right? This is what we call the Sermon on the Mount. And he is going to lay it all out. This is, I mean, you know, this is the first one. So What he's got to say is really must be something he really wants to get across. Obviously, Jesus is God, so he knew what all he was going to say, but he had thought about what he wanted to say the first time he gets up, kind of preach his first message, all right? You know, people ask me during the week, what do you do? I say, I don't do anything. Actually, I do. I just don't come up here on Sunday and think, I'm going to talk and see what comes out. No, there's preparation. So Jesus knew what he's going to say, and he picked very specific things to talk about. In Matthew chapter 5, that kind of records this message. It says in verse 90, this is called inside the Beatitudes. It's kind of its first point of his message. He's talking about blessed or happy are the people that. In in verse 9, it says, blessed or happy are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Now, wait a second. I mean, there's a lot of things that Jesus could have spoke on, right? But he says, look, let me tell you something. Something that's of value to the kingdom, something that's of value to the Father, is that you are a peacemaker, that you are a person that pursues peace. And I love it. It says, if you're a peacemaker, here's what you'll be called. 
you'll be called a good person. Nope. He says, if you're a peacemaker, you'll be called a child of God. He is saying your resemblance to the Father looks closest when you're pursuing peace. Now, I don't know about you, but when someone has a baby, a friend or a relative has a baby, you go visit that baby for the first time. The one of the things I do when I get there is I'm always looking for who does this baby look like, right? I can see her eyes and, and I, she, she has your, your nose or we start looking for family resemblance. You know, when we had our kids looking at, Allie and Zeke were both born, we always begin to kind of, early discussions, who does she look like? Even in firstborn where they have really no distinguishable features. I think she has your eyes, right? We are looking for family resemblance. We like to see the connection. And Jesus says, look, here's how you see what looks like the father is the person that pursues peace. Peacemakers resemble their father. Peacemakers will be called the children of God. Jesus is speaking out, hey, look, we want people who follow, the people of the kingdom, to be peacemakers. In order to be a peacemaker, we first need to understand what is a peace breaker or a peace, ta- a peace taker, shall we say. What is it that robs us ability to have peace with others? The first thing in my life when I allow this to reign as a peace breaker is pride. Pride is the ultimate peace breaker. You remember back in the garden? Adam, Eve, and Eve's been, the serpent's come to tempt Eve and, hey, you need to eat this fruit. And one of the things he kind of relies on, he says, if you eat this, then you'll be like God. And this kind of rose up, yeah, I want to be like this, this idea of self-importance, of what's most important is myself. And in that temptation, peace was broken. When we live in a place of pride, we immediately break peace with others. Let me give you a verse. This is Paul talking about it. This is in Romans 12, 16. Paul's saying this, live in harmony with each other. Do not be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people and don't think you know it all. He is saying, look, look, here's, and and it's interesting. Paul, throughout the New Testament, talks a lot about living in peace with others, really living in harmony with others. And he says, look, you seek to live in harmony. First of all, you can't let get pride get in the way. Don't let pride. Pride is saying, my idea, I'm the most important, and I think of myself before I think of anyone else. Pride diminishes the importance of everybody else. When we're in a place of pride, everybody else's opinion Thoughts, feelings, desires, and thoughts matter less. Not only does pride diminish the person, but it also destroys the peace. When I'm in a place of pride, I can be easily offended. Pride is a place of where I don't want anybody to, I don't want to look bad, right? I have, I got it all together, and if someone does anything to me that offends me, it automatically leads me to a place where I want to seek revenge. Because in the end, the Bible says in Proverbs that pride comes before a fall and a haughty spirit before destruction. Pride only does, not, does not only diminish the people around us, destroy the peace, but it also in the end destroys us. Because when you think about the story, you're right, you get, you get your feelings hurt, you get offended, right? You're e- when you're in a place of pride, let's just mark it down, when we're in a place of me first, I can easily get offended. Everything offends me. Somebody says something I don't like. Someone I think makes a slide against me. Somebody doesn't do something I think they should do. I'm offended. And immediately my brain as a human being is I want to pay them back. I want revenge. Revenge at its core is this idea. I don't like how they made me feel, so I'm going to make sure they feel the way they made me feel. Like, can you say that again? I, I don't like how they made me feel, so I'm going to do something to make them feel how I felt. This is revenge. But the problem with it is, in order for revenge to happen, you have to become the person that did the greatest pain to you. That's why it says just a couple of verses later in 21, it says, don't be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Paul gets it. Look, you're going to, pride's going to get in the way. You're going to get offended. You're going to seek revenge, and you're going to try to fight them back at the very place that they hurt you. Don't become overcome with evil. Don't become overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Marcus Aurelius said the greatest type of revenge is don't become the person that hurt you. 
And in revenge, that is the problem. We always become the person that hurts us to get them back, to make them feel the same feeling. Pride destroys peace with others. Not only pride, but anger. Oh, now. All right, now we're on something, right? Anger. Anger thrives in a moment, right? Anger is something that says, you know, you made me angry. I'm going to wait on it for 10 minutes. And I'm going to react. No. Most of the time when I'm angry, it happens. I'm angry and then I'm, I don't even think about it. I react. I respond. I say something I shouldn't say. I put that dig out there. I blow up. I yell. I react. Anger thrives when they're in, in the moment. There's an ancient Chinese proverb that says this, if you are patient in one moment of anger, you will escape a hundred days of sorrow. So true. Anger. We, we all struggle with anger, don't we? Different things make us angry. I can tell you one thing that makes me angry. <laughs> Electronics make me angry. Now, people make me angry too, especially I'm down on the road. But electronics make me angry. My philosophy is you were programmed to do one thing. And when you don't do the one thing you were programmed to do, I lose it. Now, that, my anger solves no problems, right? This computer's like, oh, now he's angry. I better start working. Never has happened. It has never happened. I got angry at the computer and said, you better start working. And it says, okay, and it fixes. No, anger never solves anything. Anger always, in fact, brings conflict. There's a Proverbs that talked in Proverbs. The wisdom writer was talking about this in Proverbs 15, 18. He's talking about this. A hot-tempered person stirs up conflict. Now, we could all sit here and go, we don't need a Bible verse to tell us that's true, right? Are you around somebody? I'm not going to look at your neighbor. If you're online right now and you've got someone beside you, don't look over. Don't elbow them. They might get angry. All right, no. you, we all have angry people in our life. And we know that conflict always follows angry people. And they're angry. I can't believe all things are going wrong. I can't believe the person mad at me. Have you thought maybe it's your anger that's bringing the conflict? The Bible says a hot-tempered person stirs up conflict, but a one who is patient calms a quarrel. Isn't that so hard? Oh. So hard to be patient when I'm angry. But anger eases as I take time to think about what I'm process and process what I'm thinking and feeling. Because here's the truth: anger destroys relationships. It does. In Proverbs, another passage in Proverbs 18, 19, it talks about this. It says, If offended friend is harder to win back than a fortified city, an argument separate friends like a gate locked with bars. Man, our anger can destroy so many relationships. And not only does it destroy the peace with others, but doesn't anger also destroy the peace within? Anger. These are peace breakers. God's called us to be peacemakers. These are peace breakers. Pride, anger, and the last one's selfishness. Now, on a level, we get that, right? If I'm selfish, I'm thinking of me first. But here's the thing, and this, makes, this almost sounds common sense. If I want peace with others, my concern about not, it should not be just how I feel about the situation, but how they feel. I must take into account their feelings for things. Now, the early church had a struggle with this. And we're going to look at those verses. The first one I want to look at is actually Rome, uh, 1 Corinthians 8, 9. It says, Paul's talking here. He says, but you must be careful so that your freedom does not cause others with a weaker conscience to stumble. Now, let me give you a little context on this verse. See, at the time, these, these believers, this new faith Christianity, there, there was a lot of people who would come out of false idol worship. They would sacrifice meat and different food to idols that believed in they were God. And then when they came to Jesus, that the, the message that's preached of Jesus was that there is freedom. You're no longer under the law, and there's no under all these restrictions, and you can follow Jesus, and there's freedom in following him. In fact, I want to get another passage real quick before we continue. He just says a couple of verses later, in, or chapters later in 10, 23 and 24. You say, I'm allowed to do anything because in Christ we have freedom. And it says, but not everything is good for you. You say, I'm allowed to do anything. Who's going to judge me? God doesn't judge me. But not everything is beneficial. Look at the very next verse Paul says. Don't be concerned with your, for your own good, but for the good of others. Now, this is a revolutionary thought that I think a lot of Christians have missed. I feel peace because God's giving me peace. I can do this. Well, here's the thing. Just because I feel God's giving me peace, Paul says, look, just because you feel free and you feel, you need to take into account the other person's freedom. So this is the story. Some people who are coming out of idol worship could, felt very guilty when they ate the meat that was offered to sacrifices and idols, and so they wouldn't eat it. But some of the Christians were like, you know what? These idols were fake anyway. It don't matter. I want a good steak. I'm going to eat the steak. 
And they had freedom because in Christ, everybody's free. But Paul makes it, and he continues talking, he says, look, but when you're in the presence of the person whose conscience is convicted about eating meat, then you don't eat meat. In fact, one point he says, if it was to not offend someone, I would stop eating meat altogether. I'm like, seriously, Paul? That's some serious love right there. But see, our peace with others, I mean, it sounds silly to say, involves others. It's just not, well, I can do what I want because God's given me freedom. Yeah, in your own house, doing your own thing, sure. But when you're in the context of others, you got to find where they are at and you got to meet them there. Well, they should, they should get over that. They should understand that God says it's okay. No. Paul said, to be a peacemaker, i got to be focused on what makes them feel peace inside as well as what makes me feel at peace inside. I think Christian world could to listen to that, don't you? I mean, we are known as a people who are like, you know, forget you, or I don't care what you think because God's made it said it's okay for me, and we just cause division and fights because of this idea that, hey, it feels good to me, I don't care. I feel, it feels right to me, I don't have to make any more discussions. No, 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 I'm always coming to where you're at, and I'm seeing where you are with it, and I'm going to come and meet you where you are at. This is what the follower of Jesus looks like when they embrace Blessed are those who are peacemakers. In order to be peacemakers, we also must understand it means it's on us. By its very definition, I'm a peacemaker. It means it's something that I am a part of. I'm a peacemaker. Romans 12, 18 says this. This is Paul talking. And it's in the same passage. We've talked about pursuing peace. It says, if it's all possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do you hear that heart of Paul? He's like, look. It's not up to them. It's on you. To be a peacemaker, it is your responsibility. And I love, he says, as much as it possible, as much as I can. Now, get there's going to be situations that you can't control. There are situations outside your control. But it can't be on your lack of acting. You do everything you can do to be at peace with everyone. That's what it looks like to be a peacemaker. Why? Because we see that God values and, and really highlights making peace with others. In fact, there's a passage, Matthew 5, 24, in the same series as he's preaching that first message. It's like, Jesus, you must really have an important deal about me at peace with others, right? First message, he hits it again, 5, 23 and 24. If you are presenting a sacrifice, right? Get this. If you're presenting a sacrifice of the of altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, that means you went out and did something, you hurt them. You should go to the altar, you should pray and ask God to help him out and just go ahead and do your day. Because surely God wants me at church. No, no, he says, leave your sacrifice to the altar, go and be reconciled to the person, then come back with your sacrifice to God. That's huge. I mean, for the temple worship, coming and offering a sacrifice to the temple was the highest level of worship. It couldn't be any higher. And God says, look, look, look. I value your relationship with others just as much as I value your relationship with me. So leave your altar here. I'll be waiting on you. You need to go take care of that with the other person. Peace is on us. We say, well, you know what? I hurt them, and I'm just going to ask forgiveness and move on. No, no, no. We don't get that. If we're called to be peacemakers, this isn't my message. This is, what, this is God's word. Peacemakers. If this is what we're called to be, and it's not an if, we see it we got to take it on our responsibility to pursue peace with the people that we have hurt and offended. Now, the honest truth is in this statement, we're like, I get that. I mean, I get it. If I did something wrong, it's on me to go take care of them. We're like, yeah, I don't always do it, but I get it. Here's where it goes farther. Here's where God takes peacemaker to the next level. In Matthew 18, Jesus is talking again. <laughs> Talked a lot about it. And he's talking about when you have conflict with someone that's in the church, it's a part of your believers, part of your circle, how do you deal with conflict? As peacemakers, we understand it's about us moving. It's our responsibility. Matthew 18, 15 says this, if another believer sins against you. Now, okay, so we get it. If we offend somebody, it's on us to go and ask forgiveness. But here's the kicker. Here's how much God values peacemaking. I mean, come on, this is getting really hard for me, convicting. He says, you go and privately point out the offense. Do you hear that? 
When they offended you, you need to go to them to make it right. What do we always say? Well, they did it. I'm not going to, they're done. Until they come to me and apologize, we're done. I mean, that's what I say. Anybody else in here felt that way? Yeah. Jesus says, no, no, no. A peacemaker is a person that that pursues the position of peace with others when they have offended or hurt you. Will Smith did this little video online, and it talked about fault and responsibility. I love it. You can check it out when you go home. He talked about there's a difference between fault and responsibility. People say, it's not my fault. This is not my responsibility. He said, no, no, no. They're two separate things. Regardless of whose fault it is, it is always your responsibility to do something about it. God says the same thing. Regardless of whose fault it is, well, they should have known better. They should have done, they, should, they hurt me. They said this. They did this. Or they didn't do this. Or they ignored me. Or whatever the situation is, right? They're gonna, I'm going to wait for them. God says, no, no, no. You're a peacemaker. You pursue the position of peace with others. This is what I highlight. This is what it looks like your father. Because of what your father did. This is what God did. He came for us when we were still sinners, when we were enemies of him. He came and pursued peace for us. He didn't wait for us to come to him. God says, you want to look like a father. You want to look like a father. Did you pursue peace with the people that have hurt you? And the first place you start, I love it, says, I love it says go privately. <laughs> we don't do privately. Here's what we do. Somebody offends us. We get the next three people that you know are on our side. And we tell them about it. Okay, Blake, stepping on toes. We're on the beach here now, all right? It's true. We look for people to validate our feelings. Like, did you, let me tell you about so-and-so. And, they're, and you're willing to say, oh, my gosh, they're horrible. What? I can't believe this. And you're like, yeah, exactly. That's exactly how I feel. <laughs> you want someone to, and I get that. We want, but look, the point of this Jesus talking here, of dealing with conflict, is not to feel better. Is to be better. Yeah. It's a reconciliation. This is the heart of Jesus with people. Reconciliation. Moving to a point that we can be back in relationship. It says go privately. So that means you don't go to your three friends and tell them what happened to you. When someone offends you, you go to them. Now, it's interesting. Some people say, I'm just going to work it out on my own. I'm not going to tell anybody. That, That does not make common sense because the two people that caused it have to be the two people that finish it. Well, somebody hurt me, and I'm going to do it on my own. You can't. You need the other person engaged in that. Well, it's just me and Jesus. No, nope. you're going to have to engage that person because it is not just your feelings that are engaged in this. There's a point of reconciliation. This person needs to learn and understand and also come to a place of reconciliation. I know we don't like it, and I know a lot of us are going to like, well, I'm not listening to that message. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, God says, are you going to be a peacemaker? Is I pursue peace with the people who offended me. I go to them privately, and I love this. And it says to point out the offense. In the Greek, the word point out carries the context. This Greek word carries the context of not just sharing a fact. It literally, in the Greek, it carries the idea of, of bringing a bigger, uh, kind of almost stating a case, giving the whole picture. In counseling, you may have heard when you have conflict with somebody, you say, you just don't say, well, you hurt me. You just don't tell the what, you tell the how. You hurt me because here's what it made me feel or here's what I heard it th- said to me or here's what it made me think about. You begin to share the, broad, the broader span of the conflict, of the hurt, right? That's what, you, that's what they talk about in counseling. Not just say, well, you did this. No, here's what it did to me. That's so cool in the Greek. It says this. Don't just point it out as a point like, I'm going to tell you all your list of wrongs. It is this. Let me tell you what you did and let me tell you how it affected me. And look at this next part. If the person listens and confesses, you've won this person back. I didn't get to say this in the first gathering, so the first gathering missed it, but I love this. This is great. The word won in Greek, or won over, or or brought back, is the idea of exchanging something from good to better. What it's really saying is, when you handle conflict properly, you not only restore a relationship, it actually gets better, it actually becomes better deeper. We're afraid that we handle conflict, we're going to lose it. But God says the opposite. If I'm bold enough in confidence to step into the I want peace and reconciliation with a person, not only will I restore what was broken, but it will come back to me 
better, a deeper relationship. I can tell you the times when I've handled it the right way in my life, that is so true. There was a man that I dealt with. We had a lot of conflict, and I avoided it, and I avoided it, and I avoided it. And guess what avoiding does? It does no good. It brings us anger and pride and selfishness and hurt, and it never solves it. And I finally said, okay, I need to handle this. I need to handle this in love. And so I went and talked to this person, and it was a tough talk, and it wasn't like, Hugs and rainbows the first time we talked, but we pursued it together. And in the end, after a couple of weeks of hashing it out, my friendship with him was deeper than it ever was before. Jesus says, to be a peacemaker, you pursue peace with the people around you who have hurt you. And the first place you go is one-on-one. Don't tell your friends, your mothers, and your neighbor. You go to them and say, look, here's what it did. Let me tell you how it made me feel. Here's what I experienced. If they listen then your relationship's deeper. But it's always not the case, right? Well, it's so-and-so. It wasn't me. I didn't do it. I don't care, right? So what happens next? Because we're pursuing peace and not just about you getting feeling better, because here's most of us pat ourselves on the back. If I did that enough, I'm like, dang, I've done a good job. At least I talked to the person. He wasn't interested. Done. I feel better about myself. I tried. But God says, no, no, no. Your job is to be a peacemaker. You pursue the position of peace. So he says, keep going. But if you're unsuccessful, this is verse 16. But if you're unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. Let me give you a little clarity. One to two that you bring back, not the, not the gang that's going to beat them up if they don't agree with you. They're not there to gang up on them. It's actually a person, the idea of context, of a, a, a counsel, a, a witness, the people who could maybe intermediate between you. Who do you bring? Who are the two or three? Are they the ones that are about ready to fight with you? No, no, no. The two to three that you bring or one to two that you bring, here's the characteristic you're looking for. Their greatest desire is reconciliation, not revenge. Their greatest desire is not for you to feel better, but for peace to be made. If you find people that you say, yep, their greatest desire not just to make my get my back, or to make them feel bad, or to gang up with them, but they really want to seek peace, then those are the two you bring back with you. You find people outside of the immediate situation to mediate your situation. Jesus says, this is what a peacemaker does. You pursue peace one-on-one, privately, if it doesn't work, you bring two, three, two, one or two people back who have a desire to seek peace, and you help them. They witness what's happening. They can mediate. They can help you and them come together. Then it says this, But if you're unsuccessful, then you say you did enough and you're done. You go home and you feel really good. You feel really spiritual because you tried twice. No, but it says in verse, keep going. If that person refuses to listen, take your case to the church. A couple caveats need you to know. First of all, the word church is not the building. It's actually the word ecclesia. Jesus used it. It's a group of people called out for a specific purpose. And also in this group, he's not take it in front of everybody and share with everybody. There's, the Bible says in Proverbs that with a, there's a multitude of counsels that you find wisdom. You need, again, to find somebody that you believe has wisdom, someone that you feel respect, and someone that's following God, and you bring it before the church and say, look, here's the situation. Let me give a little caveat. This isn't between you and your neighbor or you and your coworker. This is about somebody in the seat that sits beside you. This is someone who has already signed on to this ecclesia thing. They are already a part of the church, all right? It may be this church or it may be another church. If it's another church, then pick the church you want to go to and find some wise counsel. Look, he said, this is awkward. This is a lot of work because God's not interested in just you feeling better. He is interested in us, reconciliation and finding peace with others because when we live seeking such passionately peace with others, we look like our father. I don't know about you, but I grew up, and I know Amanda grew up, we grew up in churches that peace was not the thing they pursued. If the color of the carpet was different, if someone said something they didn't like, the church split and went in different directions. The church was so fighting with each other that they had no witness in, our, in their community. There was no place that they looked like the Father. The greatest tool the enemy wants to do is for us to turn on each other. That's why Jesus, when he said, the greatest thing they will know you by my disciples, by the love that you have one for another. We must pursue peace with fellow believers because it is what we, it looks like we look closer to our Father and it gives us the best ability to help the world see Jesus Christ. It's, it's, a, it's a deal, right? I mean, a lot of us just like, this, it hurt me, I'm going to move on, I'm not going to deal with it. But you're not at peace with them because the next time you see them, you think about that. 
how you talk to them changes, how you interact with them changes, then pride gets in. You always judge them when you see them. Well, you know, they're pretty good except they, you know. Or every time you see them, anger, right? I see them, they're always acting like they're this person, but they come to me and blah, anger. Peace breakers. God has called us to be peacemakers, to pursue peace. Did we hear this, church? To pursue peace. That's interesting. It, it, it says this, keep reading verse 17. If the person still refuses to listen, okay, this person is really, feels like they're right and you're wrong or they don't care, take, yeah, take it to the church. Then if you, or she will not accept the church's decision, this is the tough part. It says, treat the person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. Dang, Jesus, it's getting a little rough now. Let me think about it. What he's saying is, you might need to put some distance. You talk to any counselor about conflict and there's no resolution, they said you need to take a break. There's people in your life that will not, are not looking for a conciliation. You need to put space and put a distance between you and them. But it doesn't get us off the hook still. Because even though we put a distance, we must still be in a place of willingness to receive, to forgive them and back in re- and for relationship. How do I know? Because I see how Jesus treated the corrupt tax collector. Zacchaeus, he was corrupt. Jesus said, I'm going to come to your house today. And immediately he came down. And what did Zacchaeus do? He repented. I'm sorry, I'm going to give back to all the people I've stolen from. He begins to confess and that in that moment, it builds a place for relationship. Here's the truth. You take it this far, and you've pursued peace the whole way, and there's still no peace, then you, it is right for you to say, okay, we need to take a break. We need a distance. But a lot of us, when we do that, say, I'm done. I am, I've tried four times. I've gone through this whole cycle, and they still not forgiveness. So forget you. I'm done with you. And God says, no. Nope. Yeah, you need to treat them like this, but look how I treated them. I was always open for relationship and forgiveness. How do we know that's what he was saying? Because Peter, who was just, I love Peter. All the other, we're going to look at the, the, the apostles this summer, the rest of the series, and learn each apostle. I like Peter because Peter says so many things, and I'm like, that was what I was thinking, Peter. At least I'm not the only one that feels like a heathen when I'm thinking this. You know what Peter says after he goes through talking about this? Very, just a couple of verses later after Jesus talks about that, he goes, Jesus said, well, how many times, Peter says, how many times should I forgive them? Seven times? He's like, there's one time I got, I got to try to forgive some. Because here's the thing. Our greatest struggle with finding reconciliation is we think, well, they're just going to do it again. Have you ever forgiven somebody? Have you ever had reconciliation with somebody that said, I'm sorry, I'll never do it again. But in your head, you know, they're going to do it again. So in your head, you go, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop pursuing reconciliation. And Peter goes, how many times do I do this, Jesus? Seven times? And why he said seven times? Because rabbinical law, they kind of did rabbinical, not law, but teaching, said seven times was enough. But the eighth time, you were done. You could hate them. That was their teaching. Seven times, that's a godly. Eight times, you're out of it. <laughs> and Peter's like, I'm going to do the godly thing. Jesus, how many times should we go? Seven times? And, he, and he's probably to beg Jesus to go, yes, Peter, what a wise and spiritual statement. Hmm. Jesus says, no, 70 times seven. I could, could you imagine Peter's face at that moment? What's Jesus saying? Reconciliation is always the place, the position that we're in. We don't like that. We want to say it's done because we feel hurt and we feel vulnerable. But God says, in with me, because A, you have peace with me and you have peace within, you can live in a place of vulnerability, seeking to be at peace with others. It doesn't mean you have to stay in that situation. They keep hurting you. You may have to distance from them, but you're always in a place of forgiveness. And you say, there's no way I can do that. And I will say, absolutely, there's no way I can do it either on my own. Only through Christ's help. But he says, you know what a peacemaker looks like? They pursue peace and never stop. And let's be real. We like that God does that. Anybody here say, I think seven times is enough <laughs> with God. <laughs> Not if we're going, God, I know it's seven times. Give me one more time. We are glad that God continues to seek reconciliation and, and forgiveness in our life. Don't, aren't we happy for that? So why should we not follow our Father? 
We have a family resemblance when we pursue peace. Because here's the end. Here's the truth. When we don't have peace in life, how about peace with others, peace inside, or peace with God? It robs us of quality of life. Not only does it rob us of quality of life, but it robs the people around us. Remember Ann Flanders and Dear Abby? Just a couple years before um, Epi passed away, Dear, uh, Ann Landers, they, they got back together. They finally made their amends. But because their life was so full of conflict, their daughters picked up right where they left off and are fighting. It affects people. It affects our quality of life and the people around us. The greatest example, we all know it, the Hatfield and McCoys. I say those two names, and you know exactly what's your brain think of? Fighting and feuding, maybe guns and no teeth. I don't know what you think of, but Hatfield and McCoys. Conflict, Conflict right? <laughs> now, the Hatfield and McCoys, they are from, in 1863, the, they, they think the feud started in 1863. It was right around the Civil War. And they, and they have it. It's a discussion between a pig or because one side fought for the North and one fought, side fought for the South, but there was conflict. And this conflict developed, became between two people and then moved into a family. So much so for over 100 years, the Hatfield and McCoys were in conflict. In fact, their name was synonymous with conflict and no peace. In this time, 14 individuals in both family were killed. Seven of them spent time in jail. And it got so extreme that they actually, the Supreme Court of the United States had to step in to try to solve this. He said that happened in 1863. In 1980s, Amanda's sister lived in southern West Virginia where the Hatfield and McCoys lived. And she said she worked as a bank teller. And she said that when, if they was at the bank and the McCoys came in and were doing bank work, if the Hatfields came in, the McCoys would get up and leave. This is in the 80s. Over a hundred years had passed, and yet there was still conflict. The absence of peace with each other evolved and destroyed the lives and qualities of life of hundreds and hundreds of people. 140 years passed, and in 2003, finally, the descendants of the Hatfields and the McCoys got this letter and said, we need to have a peace treaty. So they got together and they signed this peace treaty. And what they said was, we want, we want to sign this because our, our names, Hatfield and McCoys, had always been associated with anger, fighting, and strife. We want people to know that this is not the final chapter. Man, this will be safe for our lives. May the final chapters of your lives with people never end without peace. May they have peace. May they, never, may they not end in conflict. You don't know when your final chapter is with the person that you're thinking about right now. Think about that. Well, yeah, when they get to about their deathbed, I'll go get right. No, no, no. May your story, you have the chance to write the final chapter. You get the final say. You need to pursue peace with them. You say, you don't know what they did to me. I don't know what they did to you, but God did. God knows the pain. He understands your pain. He understands your reasons. He sees all that. But God says, look, I want you to pursue peace, not just for them, but for yourself. Pursue peace. Be a peacemaker because when you're at peace with others, you will experience peace within. And you can only have peace within because you have peace with God. And, and through these three things, you can have quality of life. We finish our series on peace. I don't know where you're at, where you're sitting at today or in this room, that where you're at with peace. I don't know what excuses you're hearing right now, why I don't need to or why they've gone too far. But God says, look, I value people that pursue the position of peace with others. For you today, maybe you have not have peace with someone in your family, your friends, maybe someone from the past. I ask that you pursue peace with them. But let us start with peace with God. God loves you. Your value, your worth, you, are, you have something to give. You are not a throwaway. God died and rose for you. He loves you. And he says, I will give you a peace the world cannot give. And when you step into that peace, you must then begin to hear and adopt 
what he says over you other than what you say over you or what other people have said over you. And when you embrace that, you begin to be at peace with who you are on the inside. And once you do that, you can begin to navigate peace with others. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this day, God, as we talk about peace. Man, it's something that we all want, we all long for, we all, we all value, God, but we sometimes aren't willing to take the steps to really step into the promise you've given us. God, I pray, I pray first of all, as we conclude this whole series, that we understand that peace is not a feeling to chase, that we just got to fill it with by stuff and by vacation and by getting away, but that peace is a position that you've given us. It's a, it's a gift, and it comes through your son. And then, God, may we settle in our soul who we are through you, and may we find, finally have peace within. Stop listening to the lies of the enemy who seeks to push us out of this place of peace inside. And God, may we value peace with others as, as you do, Lord. May the, Lord, I ask right now, as heads are bowed and eyes are closed, whether you're online or with us in person, just take a moment. God, reveal to me, where am I not at peace with someone? And that person or those people come to your mind, I want you to pray this prayer. God, give me the courage and the belief to pursue peace with that person. Remind me, Lord, that I look most like you and I'm a peacemaker. Lord, help us as followers of Jesus be known as peacemakers and not peace breakers or peace takers. We love you, Lord. We pray that you will speak in us and through us. May we experience the peace that you give to Jesus Christ and may we embrace the peace in ourselves so that we can live at peace with others. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Blake. What a powerful message for us this morning to think about. I don't know about you, but I think how that applies to me and how I long for peace and to really process what is my responsibility in that process. So thank you this morning for that. We're going to move into a time of giving. Um, and here at Radius, we believe that generosity generates goodness. And we see that all the time as the the impact of your generosity and the way that you guys give. I thought this morning as I drove up and we were feeding our friends in need and the power of your generosity and how it is making a difference, particularly in this season when people are experiencing hardships, that we've been able to meet those needs and we've been able to be a light and a source of love for them in this season. And we do that because of your generosity. So thank you for your gift, and know that we are grateful for that. We want to know, we let, oh, there are several ways to give. Here we go. <laughs> there are several ways to give at Radius. Um, we want to make it simple. That's what I was trying to say. We want to make it simple and convenient for you. You can do that by going online at radchurch.com slash giving, and you can, there's a drop-down box there. You can give one time. You can give, or you can do it on a reoccurring so you don't have to think about it. You also can mail in your check if you would like to do that. We have a mailbox that we check regularly, and also if you are here this morning, there is a contactless box as you exit out that you can drop it in. So there are multiple ways to make it easy and convenient for you, um, and we are just grateful for your generosity. We've had a great morning, a lot to think about and a lot to process. And thank you for being here. And we would say this week, have a good week, and we will see you next week.